Hello, everyone. Welcome to a very special bonus interview for the Psychedelic Sacred Medicines and Purpose free virtual conference. I'm your host, Beth Weinstein. I'm a business coach helping current and aspiring spiritual entrepreneurs align with their true purpose and grow their business so that you can help more people do what you love and live a life you love. And today I am so honored to bring you Dr. Rick Doblin. Hi, Rick. How are you? Hello, Beth. I'm doing great. Thank you for uh, having me. Thank you for being here, Rick. So if you don't know who Rick Doblin is, <laughs> I'm really surprised. <laughs> but um, Rick Doblin is the founder and executive director of the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, also known as MAPS. He received his doctorate in public policy at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, where he wrote his dissertation on the regulation of the medical uses of psychedelics and marijuana, and his master's thesis on a survey of oncologists about smoked marijuana versus the oral THC pill and nausea control for cancer patients. His undergraduate thesis at New College of Florida was a 25-year follow-up to the classic Good Friday experiment, which evaluated the potential of psychedelic drugs to catalyze religious experiences. He also conducted a 34-year follow-up study to Th Timothy Leary's Concord Prison Experiment. Rick studied with Dr. Stanislav Groff, and was among, among the first to be certified as a holotropic breathwork practitioner. His professional goal is to help develop legal context for the beneficial uses of psychedelics and marijuana, primarily as a prescription medicine, but also for personal growth and otherwise healthy people, and eventually to become a legally licensed psychedelic therapist. He founded MAPS in 1986 and currently resides in Boston with his wife, two dogs, and empty rooms from three children, one of whom is in college and two have graduated. <laughs> so, Rick, your story is just incredible. Um, you know, not a lot of people know your full story. How did you get on your path to creating MAPS and even doing your, you know, undergraduate yeah. work in this, which was probably very taboo at the time? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, in fact... <laughs> It, the only thing you could do at that time was a survey of people that had done psychedelic research, been subjects in the past, because at the time there was a complete blockade on any new psychedelic research. Wow. But I, I would say the way I got into this was really through despair and fear. And so I was um, educated as a very young boy about the Holocaust and Jewish and just the idea of uh, mass murder like that and the power of the irrational to overwhelm people's rationality and to have scapegoats. It just terrified me and it also made me think about the mind and about psychology and that, you know, you could have a normal job, you could do, you could be wealthy, you could, you could still end up in the concentration camp. So this idea of studying um, sort of the irrational and studying how do we clear out and help people process their emotions. And that was a, a a big uh, factor and then it was uh, further um, developed in me this sort of despair and fear by being a young boy in school during the height of the cold war with russia and you know we're taught duck and cover under your desk if there's a nuclear war and that didn't reassure people very much <laughs> certainly me and then the vietnam war and, and so that was also um, now it's my own country doing things that I thought. So it, it really just drove me more and more towards studying the mind and studying psychotherapy and trying to help people who get overwhelmed with fears and anxieties. And so I, I had everything uh, going for me in a sense, a loving family. My dad was a doctor. My mom was a teacher. Um, so I, I had all of this kind of support to help me deal with the fear and anxieties that were the bigger threats sort of to my family, to me. And then I was a draft resistor and was uh, planning to go to jail for um, not going to Vietnam. And my parents were like, well, that's okay, but you know, you're never going to have a real job because you're going to be a felon. And I'm like, mm -hmm. it's sad that that's going to be the price I have to pay, but I'm willing to pay it. Um, and then I started taking LSD <laughs> as a 17-year-old, um, 18-year-old in college. And that started um, doing things for me that were powerful. And, and I felt like um, psychedelics were doing for me what my bar mitzvah should have done, <laughs> but didn't do. <laughs> Meaning sort of get me to answer spiritual questions, get out of my own ego, sort of think about the larger world. And so I, I, I had grown up though in the 60s and really believed all the anti-psychedelic propaganda. And once I started doing psychedelics, which is in 1971 and 72, and then realized their potential, um, 
then I looked around. It was, um, I looked around and um, I wasn't able to um, really do any work because they were all criminalized and the research had been shut down. So I thought, this is a crazy world. You know, psychedelics felt like to me to have incredible political implications, which I saw during the 60s too, of people that had these spiritual experiences. And then once you can identify with people who are different than you, or, or you identify with being part of everything, then people who are different from you are not that different. You know, we have more in common than not. And so that became my solution to this dehumanization, mass murder, um, scapegoating, prejudice, the sense that we're all connected, sort of the spiritual experience and then the political implications of that. So in view of the fact that I had very few job opportunities because I thought I would be a felon, I thought, oh, I could be an underground psychedelic therapist. You don't need a license for that. So at age 18, that's where I um, focused my life. And then um, a few years later, uh, Jimmy Carter, his first day in office as president, president, he pardoned all the draft resistors. And so that made me start thinking, ah, now I can do this above ground. And so that's where um, the long story began of trying to come up from the underground to legitimize this area. Wow. It's, and it's, yeah, and I, I can't, you know, when I heard this the other week that it just started in 1986, you know, I knew that, but it really hit me hard how long it's been to get to this point where now we're talking about decriminalization. Now it's becoming very common. Now, even with doing this conference, I'm, I'm actually surprised at the amount of therapists that have reached out and said, I want to start integrating this work into my practice because people see the benefits. So you've come a really long way. <laughs> yeah. Well, and actually it was 1972 when I really focused my life. And so I think that 2022 is when we'll probably, the end of 2021, 2022 is when we'll have FDA approval for the prescription use of MDMA assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. So it'll be a 50 year process. And then I'll be able to start my real career as a, a legal psychedelic therapist. <laughs> a little bit of uh, preparation time, you could say. <laughs> In retirement. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, it'll be fantastic, actually, to be a, a legal psychedelic therapist. Amazing. Actually, yeah. So talking about legal psychedelic therapy, because, again, a lot of the conference viewers have reached out that they're coaches, integration, you know, a lot of people want to start doing integration therapy, therapists who have clearly worked with the, these medicines on their own, and then want to start talking about it, or at least integrating it into their practice, or at least go doing training. Can you tell us a little bit about MAPS and their latest initiatives with, I know you guys offer up trials and have trainings, and I mean, there's so many initiatives going on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically, we're um, here to try to produce uh, options for psychiatrists and psychotherapists. Um, and so we're, MAPS was started in 86, as we said, as a nonprofit pharmaceutical company trying to focus on psychedelics and marijuana and bring them through the system and then have them prescription drugs. And so we're into what's called phase three. So that's the final stage of research where you do these large scale, double blind, placebo controlled studies looking to prove safety and efficacy. And then if you do that, then you can get approval for prescription use. And so we've started the MAPS Public Benefit Corporation, which is gonna be the vehicle that we'll use to actually sell MDMA as a medicine. And we're trying to demonstrate not just a new approach to mental health, which is uh, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, but a new approach to providing medical care and therapeutic care through what are called public benefit corporations. So that's where you maximize public benefit, not profit. And so MAPS, the nonprofit, connects, collects donations. Then we uh, transfer them to the public benefit corporation. The public benefit corporation will um, do the research and we'll eventually get the license to sell MDMA. We'll sell MDMA at a slight profit, not an exorbitant profit, because most of the money is going to go to therapists. Mm -hmm. Most of the cost is for the, the therapy. It's the, the drug is a minimal part of it, but we'll make some money selling MDMA and then it's all owned by the nonprofit. So that'll go for more research and education. And what we've got now is a program of training therapists that involves um, a series of steps which I'll explain. And we also do what's called um, psychedelic harm reduction. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you started talking about helping people integrate. 
but we do it on site at Burning Man and festivals around the world where people are, um, you know, using these drugs, it's not always wisely. And sometimes they get into deeper struggles than they had anticipated. Mm -hmm. And then rather than getting them tranquilized or arrested, um, we'll help them. So last year, not that long ago, a few months ago at Burning Man, um, you know, we had over 550 people that came and we had over 400 volunteers. So we have some trainings that are called Zendo trainings. Mm -hmm. We had a, a cardboard Zendo that was used for Zen meditation, but then it was given to us to use for psychedelic harm reduction. Mm. Um, and so we have trainings there, but the, the trainings for therapists, um, and what, what's important to say here is that what we're talking about with the FDA is MDMA-assisted psychotherapy with the emphasis on psychotherapy. And so the FDA has said that as this becomes a medicine, the only people that will be able to prescribe it and the only people that will be able to treat patients are people that have been trained in the therapeutic method that was used to approve the drug. So what that means, MAPS as the sponsor will have to train people, not just hand out MDMA, but it's how you do it. Um, once we've trained them, we'll have a list. And that list of people that are approved on this training will be the only ones that can provide it to uh, patients. But they can innovate. They can do things that are different than what we've trained, but they have to have the basic knowledge that we've provided. And so the first part is about 14 hours online, learning about PTSD, learning about MDMA, um, watching some videotapes of therapy sessions, just getting a general introduction. Then we have a, a six-day residential program where people come, usually a maximum of 50. And we've now trained about three, 400 people in this. Um, and so they, they come for a week of uh, watching videotapes, talking about our treatment manual, which if any of the people watching this would like to um, read it, it's up on the MAPS website, on the research section. Um, you go to MDMA, and then at the bottom of that page, it says treatment manual. So that describes our manualized approach. The, the core aspect of that is this um, belief that, uh, I, I would say hypothesis, that there's this healing mechanism of the psyche, the same way that there is of the body. We know that the body heals itself. We think that the psyche has something very similar. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> um, and, and so what that leads to is this treatment manual, this treatment method that is relatively unstructured and interdirected. We don't use the word guide. We're not the guides. The people's unconscious is the guide. And so things come up to the surface. Basically, you can think of psychedelics, MDMA as well, that there's a barrier between the conscious and the unconscious mind, a, a membrane, you could say. And when we dream, that membrane is more permeable. We have these kind of feelings and emotions and thoughts and dreams. And psychedelics change this um, relationship in this membrane, and more stuff comes up from the unconscious. Stan Groff, who we talked about before, the world's leading LSD researcher, said that LSD is a nonspecific amplifier of the unconscious. He also said LSD is for the study of the mind, what the microscope is for biology and the telescope is for astronomy. They're tools to see things that we might not otherwise be able to see. And so the view that we have is that there's some wisdom of the psyche that we don't know from the outside, but what comes up is something that we help people to process, to express, to experience, later on to integrate, but we don't have a script. We don't have a sense. If you're, we're working with people with PTSD, we don't say start out with the trauma. They might go to a beautiful, happy experience as a way to build strength for this. They might go, instead of the trauma, we, we see this a lot, that um, a lot of the veterans, for example, who have PTSD, will go to childhood trauma. You think it's all about what happened in the war, but mm. it goes to something that happened in childhood that made them feel powerlessness. And that's why they went to the military. And then this other thing, so it's compounding kind of trauma. So we don't know that ahead of time. And people often don't know it either because they've suppressed a lot of stuff. So what comes up is something that we um, try to help them experience. And a lot of times things come in the body, not just in the mind consciously. 
So there's a lot of somatic therapies. And, uh, you know, Bessel van der Kolk, who's um, the principal investigator of our Boston site, you know, has written this book about PTSD called The Body Keeps the Score. So yeah, a lot of times things come up in the body. It could be painful. It could be just tension, any number of different things. I worked with somebody whose uh, arm became paralyzed under the influence of MDMA. And we knew that um, this was way back a long time ago. It was still legal, but we knew it was not real paralysis. And it turned into several hours of a story about how his family it gathered together, he was the doctor, and they had to decide whether to take his father off of life support. And he had to write the order because he was the doctor and they all decided to do it. But then he started sharing that he hated his father. Wow. And so the conflict was maybe did he kill his father? Did he do this intentionally? And, and he couldn't express that. It just was his arm was paralyzed. And over time, as the story came out, and then as he realized that his mother agreed that his father would want this, that his siblings agreed, that he didn't actually do it out of hatred. Then the feeling came back to his arm. And then at the end of the session, he was fine. So the idea is that things come in the body, come in the mind. We, we try to help them, help people experience it, however. And we have eight-hour sessions, which are uh, usually, it's, it's, it's a two-person team, usually a male-female team. And where we're going to end up is one of them is going to be a licensed therapist and the other will be a helper, a student getting supervision. So in any case, we have this six um, day process of watching videotapes and then also discussing the treatment manual. Then we do role playing that they do at home. We videotape it and we watch their role plays. Then we have a protocol where we believe it's important for therapists who work with psychedelics to have experience with the psychedelics themselves. Mm -hmm. So we have a protocol where people, therapists in our training program can receive MDMA as a patient mm -hmm. in the exact same model with a two person team. And that takes several days. Wow. Then the final step is that we have um, the, the new team and, and they can be shifting who's on your team, but a two person team will work with one patient under supervision from our training team. And so the standard therapeutic approach is a three and a half month process. And so this is what we supervise. Um, during this three and a half months, they only get MDMA three times. Mm -hmm. It's once a month, roughly four weeks apart, but three to five weeks apart. And those are the eight hour sessions. They spend the night in the treatment center and rest and then have more integration work the next day. So three MDMA sessions, one month apart, and then 12 90-minute non-drug psychotherapy sessions as well. Wow. Once a week for three weeks as preparation before the first MDMA session to build the therapeutic alliance. And then three, three non-drug psychotherapy sessions after the first MDMA to integrate it. And then we repeat that again. Then they get another MDMA and then they get three integrative sessions and then another MDMA and three integrative sessions. Then we look at the data two months after their last session and that's when we'll compare therapy without MDMA with therapy with MDMA. Wow. And then we also look at 12 months. And that's more for insurance companies. Because what we want to have happen is that this isn't just for rich people who can pay for it. This should be covered by people's insurance. And so what we want to be showing with the 12-month follow-up is that it's not just a brief psychedelic afterglow and then it fades and you're back where you were before. Mm -hmm. And the good news is we show that at the two-month follow-up, um, people keep getting better at wow. the 12-month follow-up. And so at the 12-month follow-up, two-thirds of um, chronic, average, severe, treatment-resistant PTSD patients no longer have PTSD. Mm. So it's, it's remarkable the way MDMA can really facilitate psychotherapy. But MDMA can make people worse if it's not done in a therapeutic way. Uh, we've had people take MDMA at parties and stuff difficult comes up, and then they try to stuff it down. And once you've kind of brought this to the service, then you're even worse off in a way. And people, you know, they need to just go through it. And the, the classic psychiatric drugs just suppress symptoms. They don't really get to the cure or get to the core problem. So, yeah. so, so that, that's our training program. <laughs> Incredible. And you mentioned, it's interesting, you mentioned so much that almost every person I interviewed had mentioned about you know, the body work, you know, because yeah. I mean, even my own partner is a body-based therapist. And oh, great. great. It's, yeah, and it's, it's incredibly deep work. And it's, it, you know, one of the reasons I was called to even make this conference was, you know, I'm a business coach. I help a lot of people on this, the medicine path integrate 
the, the depth of these visionary experiences into their work, you know, into their yeah. business, into their purpose. But what I found just over many years is there's a lot of people, especially now with the availability and the popularity, there's a lot of people just doing it and doing it and maybe not getting the integration, not doing therapy, not working the somatic part. And, you know, I've actually done the Zendo training at Burning Man in 2017. Oh, great. And, um, yeah, great, that's great. But wow, there's, I mean, there's some stories, you know, there's, there's people taking a lot and then not getting the right support. And, you know, in some cases, like you just said, it could actually, you know, I, what I've seen is it can re-traumatize, it can re-trigger. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons I was like, you know, what, we need to start talking about, you know, the integration of this work for your average day-to-day -day person too, in addition yeah. to the PTSD, the, the depression, anxiety, but what about just the, the regular user who might be just doing it and not getting the right support. So I love that you mention the importance of actual psychotherapy without the drugs. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's the, I think this has actually helped the FDA be very comfortable with what we're doing. Wow. Because what we're saying is uh, um, it's not the drug. It's the drug therapy combination. And I would say that the ketamine, which has S-ketamine, which has been approved for depression, it does have a pharmacological effect, which can be very helpful, but it's being administered without any psychotherapy. Hmm. And I think that's good for the pharmaceutical company because it doesn't work as well and you need more ketamine. But if they were to combine ketamine with psychotherapy, it would be more effective, but they have no incentive to do that. So I think most ketamine clinics, uh, I'm not comfortable with what they're doing. They, they will be helping people, but it's very short-lived, the effect. You need to keep coming back. It gets to be very expensive. And so I think um, pharmaceutical companies, other than those that are focused on psychedelics, don't understand psychotherapy. And they just want to eliminate that, just buy our drug over and over and over. But that's really not optimal at all. Now, but then what is your theory about, you know, how this is going to play out, you know, because all of us, you know, those of us out there that are more on the natural healing path, you know, think of big pharma as just the evil, because we all yeah. know that, you know, even the, the, the past antidepressants, you know, we all know they haven't really done anything, yeah. they haven't cured anybody. And what from what I've seen, they've made a lot of people worse. But is this, do you think that this is going to play out in the same way? It's just going to be about money and greed and, you know, like, let's see how much psilocybin we can put in a pill and sell and we don't care if it does anything. I, mean, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think uh, it'll come out that way. So first off, um, there's Maps, there's Compass, and there's USONA are the only three companies right now really trying to develop uh, psychedelics. Compass and USONA, psilocybin, Maps for MDMA. There will be more coming up. Mm -hmm. um, USONA is a nonprofit. Compass is for profit. But I think they both are really thinking that it's the drug psychotherapy combination. Mm. It's a drug plus support. And we're just discussing with FDA about what are the requirements once post-approval. So those are called REMS, which mean risk evaluation and mitigation strategies. So the FDA can impose REMS on drugs that have particular risks. And so right now, it's pretty clear, based on what all three of us groups have said, that there will be requirements for training of the therapists that give it, that it's not going to be just about maximizing, you know, selling the most <laughs> and getting it out there. Uh, and where I think it will go is the other part is that these drugs plus therapy are, because there's a therapy component, they're only administered under direct supervision. So mm -hmm. it's not like come to your pharmacy and get your prescription for MDMA or psilocybin and then go do it at home. I think that that's, um, should happen in the sense that we should have drug policy reform. The system of prohibition is counterproductive. So I think adults should have legal access to these things. But what I think will happen in the long run is, well, starting 2021, 2022, we'll start developing psychedelic clinics. So in 1974 was the first hospice in America, and now there are 6,000 hospices. Wow. over you know 35 years. So I think we're going to end up with like five or 10,000 psychedelic psychotherapy treatment centers throughout the United States. And we'll have cross training. That's what we're doing with these other groups with Compass and USONA, that a lot of the people who are learning about MDMA want to learn about psilocybin. And they also want to learn about ketamine. Yeah. And eventually they'll want to learn about LSD or ayahuasca or ibogaine or, or other things. So there'll be a new specialty of psychedelic psychotherapy. 
and we will eventually have a whole range of drugs approved for adjunct to psychotherapy. And your psychedelic psychotherapist in the future will kind of individualize. This will be the, the ultimate of individual medicine. You know, we're like, you talk it over, what are you what are your symptoms? What are your issues? What's your past history? Let's start with MDMA. Then let's go to ayahuasca or go to psilocybin or end up with MDMA or, or some kind of thing like that. So I wow. think that it's going to be like that. And I think when we move into a drug policy reform era where people can have these things on their own, we're going to train loads of people in peer support. So I think what will happen is we want mass mental health. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. And we want people healing themselves. And I think it'll be the hardest cases that go to these clinics. Mm. But I think that there's going to be millions of those hardest cases. So these therapists are going to be more busy than they want to be. You know, more patients that need help. Than, and at the same time, we'll be embedding the wisdom about how these things can be used in a post-prohibition world in the general population. So that, that's the vision. <laughs> this is so exciting. Great. This is, this is exactly why I wanted to talk to you. So then what is your theory? Because, you know, I made this in relation to, you know, the vision for what I see as the future of how we do business, what conscious yeah. entrepreneurship is, how do we treat the earth? How do we treat each other? You know, a lot of people on this path have, you know, they're, they're also on a spiritual growth path. You know, it's very similar to mine. It's like I've been doing psychedelics for 30 something years but got into Buddhism, meditation, you know, insurance yeah. sports, all the other things. And eventually people are called to help, right? Help guide each other, help, you know, create change on the planet, become leaders. You know, what is your, what is your theory as to how this will actually have a larger effect on yeah. potentially the future of the world, you know, the government, the way we do everything? Yeah. Like, you know, maybe I'm an optimist, but... Um, <laughs> well, no, I, I think um, there is hope. Uh, so I, I think that if you look at the increase in rates of suicide and depression among young people, mm. what that means is that the world is in crisis. The world is on fire. We've got a, a would-be dictator as president of the United States. We've got uh, fanning the flames of anxiety and fear. We've got the rise of fundamentalism, the rise of um, hatred of the other, of, uh, you know, immigrants are terrible. You know, it's, it, it's stressful. So everybody is feeling stress and we're having the spread of nuclear weapons. We just heard Turkey wants to get nuclear weapons. So it's a very perilous time. And I think that everybody is going through a lot of stress and change. And so what we need is this um, sort of widespread um, transition into a deeper spirituality among the general public. And I think that what we see that this is kind of um, that mysticism is the antidote to fundamentalism mm -hmm. so that we see the the fundamentalists of the different religions that are taking their scriptures literally and that are then hating other people and then they're also um, challenging people that, that think differently mm -hmm. and, and they're they're getting more and more rigid the, the world is becoming globalized we're becoming more aware of multiple different spiritual systems they're like languages. They're not one right language or wrong language. It's not like Judaism is better than Christianity or anything like that. There's just different flavors of spirituality and different sim symbol systems. And I think we'll move to um, an underlying sense that we're all in it together. The, the astronauts talk about it from seeing the Earth from space. And yet that will help us celebrate the differences and celebrate the unique. Uh, the uniqueness of the different religions. So I think we'll end up having um, this idea of mass mental health, which will also mean mass spirituality. And where it will impact business is that this um, idea that the um, economy has to keep growing, you know, gross national product, you know, that's like uh, cancer, you know, just grows, unlimited growth is cancer. And, and look what we're doing to destroying the environment. So mm -hmm. I think we'll end up using technology in brilliant ways because we, we, we our mind is so far ahead of our emotions and spirituality so I, i'm that's that's where i think a lot of the optimism comes from. the power of the human mind the pessimism comes from sort of the animal natures that, that we haven't risen above yet and mm -hmm. how do we refine that and i think we'll end up having to work a whole lot less because we'll have our basic needs met we're not going to have to constantly um, things will grow and get better but we'll have more time for music, for art, for therapy, for relationships, for spirituality, for celebration, 
and we'll do it in a way that's sustainable on the earth. So that's the big vision. And I think psychedelics can play a major role in that because people get into these patterns of thought um, and, and you get stuck in them. So one of the most exciting um, studies that was recently completed and published in a journal called NeuroImage was lifelong Buddhist meditators, Zen Buddhist meditators, lifelong, who hadn't done psychedelics in decades and decades and decades, if ever, went to a meditation retreat center in Lucerne, Switzerland, for a, a five-day meditation retreat. Beforehand, they went to the University of Zurich for brain scans, and afterwards, they went for brain scans. And in the middle, on day three, they got a pill, and it was either psilocybin or a placebo. And what they wanted to see is, would they have an experience that would deepen their meditation practice? Would it affect altruism, compassion, brain changes? And they found that it did. And so what we're seeing is that Zen Buddhism, which has been somewhat anti-drug, anti-intoxication, you know, that, that meditation and psychedelics are coming back together again. <laughs> it's not one or the other. It doesn't mean if you're a lifelong meditator, you got a trip every week, you know, once a decade even, you know, that every once in a while you have these experiences that no matter how much you think we're unpatterned and we're open to anything, we, we all develop our sort of grooves of our mind and it's hard to get out of them. And so I think we're seeing to, uh, a growing together of spirituality and psychedelics, meditation and psychedelics, mindfulness, and that it'll be um, a range of options at different times. And I think that's going to be um, one of the only ways that we'll get over the current crisis. Um, you know, I did a TED Talk recently. If yeah. people want to check out my TED Talk, one of the last lines I said is that humanity is in a race between uh, catastrophe and consciousness. Mm -hmm. And the psychedelic renaissance is here to help consciousness triumph. Awesome. Awesome. I'm going to send this to my Buddhist teacher because I've gotten into arguments with him about drinking medicine because I, I work with ayahuasca pretty wow. regularly. And it's, they were, he's very anti. And I was like, you know what? It works for me. But <laughs> I'm glad you said this. Yeah, but, but Beth, what, what like is his best reason? Why is he anti? Well, because he was a former addict. So for him, it's not the path, but it actually is interesting. A lot of the sangha was on antidepressants. So, of course, I have this other view that maybe yeah. there's other ways, but maybe, you know, maybe he's changed his mind from the last time he gave me shit for <laughs> working with ayahuasca. I, I would hope so, because ayahuasca is used to help people with addiction problems. Yeah, I know. The Native American church uses peyote <laughs> to help Native Americans with alcoholism and other drug addictions. These are not drugs of addiction. And, yeah. and the, you know, because they're not a reliable escape. I mean... <laughs> ayahuasca isn't what you'd call fun oh it's not fun <laughs> <laughs> once every it's like 20 fun. times maybe <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I, it's deeply satisfying but but yeah i, I think people um over generalize from their own experience yeah. so i i do think that there, there will be this there is this coming together of uh, meditation spirituality mindfulness and psychedelics i love it so this is my last question for you so when i saw you speak at the maps benefit dinner i think it was two saturdays ago yeah. you mentioned the word education and i was like wow i'm really happy to hear this because even me doing this conference was you know it was actually a deep process like am i going to get in trouble am i going to have you know my community fighting against me because i'm breaking the law but then i'm like it's my truth and i've actually had a lot of people come forward saying, you know, how do I start sharing yeah. my personal experience? People are in the closet, especially, you know, I lived in New York City. I now live in the Hudson Valley where it's, you know, people are a little more op open-minded. I'm a burner. I've gone to Burning Man a bunch of times. But if you're, you know, in a very conservative place, a lot of people I've spoken to in Europe or in the UK where it's not as prevalent, not as accepted, you know, is this what you mean by education? Like sharing your own experience, sharing yourself? <laughs> Yeah, I think if you look at one of the major social movements of the last 50 years that has succeeded, it's the gay rights movement. And of mm. course, they're not completely where they need to be, but we have gay marriage and things like that. And I think what really made that movement succeed was people coming out. Because as long as you're closeted, people can say, oh, psychedelics will drive you crazy and nobody is contradicting it. Or psychedelics will make you uh, drop out of society and live on a commune and, and contribute nothing. And so I think that this idea of coming out to our friends, to our families, to our coworkers, to people that disagree with us, that's the kind of public education that's really necessary. And I think we're getting to the place where 
there's more willingness to do that. There's less stigma. So just as an example, Thursday, um, several days ago, last week, in the New York Times, was an amazing article about senior citizens using ayahuasca in order to um, deal with uh, anxiety, depression, fear of death. And so it was tremendous. And, it, and actually, there was a fellow named George Sarlo who was uh, in the article. And he's a Holocaust survivor. And then he became a refugee and he came to America and he was one of the early venture capitalists in Silicon Valley, was tremendously successful, but had low level depression uh, until age 74 is when he first started doing ayahuasca mm -hmm. and other psychedelics. And so that's in the New York Times. I would encourage people to, to go and um, check out that article. Um, and so I think that the stigma is decreasing. So the more people can share from their own experience, because we all know there's so much um, advertisements and promotions that are laden with exaggerations. People don't know what to trust, but they trust other people. And so the public education that you can do by sharing your own story is way more powerful than millions of dollars worth of propaganda education or advertisements and all of that. So I think that's really what we're trying to say. We're at that stage where we need people to take the courage, come out of the closet, come out of the psychedelic closet. That it, the closet's getting pretty empty because a lot of the gay people are out of the closet. So <laughs> that's, that's what that's we no, this is great. I'm so glad you said this because this is exactly what I've been feeling. You know, I was actually having a lot of fears like, wow, are people going to start, you know, watching me and monitoring my email and then are they going to show up to my house? But, you know, and then honestly, I, even if that was true, I, it's worth the risk because this is how we facilitate change on the planet. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, we're in the midst of an opiate overdose epidemic, yeah. you know, yeah. last year, um, more Americans died of drug overdoses than Americans died in all of Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan oh my God. in one year. So the police are not looking at ayahuasca. There's so many ayahuasca circles now, and most of them are not legal. They're not the formal Unao de Vegetal, UDV, or Santo Daime. Mm -hmm. So they're, those are the only ones that are legal, those specific church contexts. Most of ayahuasca is not used in those contexts, but the DEA, the police are not going after that because people are not getting harmed. And also, they've got more important things to do. Hopefully. Which they're, of course, not doing that well either. You know, but that's the idea. And psychedelics can play a major role in the opiate epidemic. Yeah. Ibogaine, which is a route from Western Africa, psychedelic drug, it helps people um, get through withdrawals from, from opiates and can then give them deep spiritual experiences that deal with the causes of them wanting to run away into drug addiction. So I, I think we'll find over time that... Um, that the, this kind of stigma is going to go way down. And before you know it, um, hopefully, you know, in the next 10 years, we'll have psychedelic clinics all over the place and it'll be mainstream and taken for granted. Like right now, you go to the YMCA and you learn yoga or, or meditation. Back 50 years ago, that would never happen. Yoga was like, people were scared of yoga. It's going to turn you into Buddhist or Hindu or whatever. And then meditation was strange and weird. And now they're in the YMCA. So I, I think if people get the courage and speak out and share their stories, that, that's what we need the most. Very important. Thank you so much, Rick. Everybody, I just want to have this call to action. If you purchase this series, the $27, 25% of it goes to MAPS. But honestly, I think it would be best if you just donate directly to MAPS. They're an amazing organization. They're really changing the face of the future of this medicine work. And if you find it important, you can go to their website. There's a button that just says donate. Rick, do you have anything else you want to say in parting words? Um, well, I share your optimism. <laughs> Thank uh, and, you. <laughs> and I think that the optimism, we need to look at the darkest um, parts of our psyche, the darkest parts of the human psyche. We need to take that optimism and take that love and caring into um, those people that are most scared and most manipulated by fears and anxieties and, and offer something alternative. And I think that together we can, we can all rejoin as one country and, and, and one world and move together in a healthier way. Thank you so much. This really means a lot to me and the thousands of listeners, and, and they're going to be so excited to hear from you. I really appreciate all the work you've done and everybody at MAPS. You guys are doing such incredible work. Thank, Thank you. you for your time. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Thank you for now. Terrific.